And we are back on Sportsman Radio. I'm your host, Chris Shanafel, and I am now joined by former NBA small forward, two-time NBA champ, and now host of NBA Game Time on NBA TV, Brent Barry. Thanks for joining the show, Brent. How's it going? It's going good, Chris. You might be the first guy to ever call me a small forward, though. Well, I know you played many that's positions. That's all right. I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> Hey man, it's hard to it's hard to call a six seven uh, NBA player even a shooting guard or a point guard. Well, there, there's a lot of them floating around the league nowadays. Amazingly enough. Yeah. Well, let's get right to it and let's talk some NBA. And we'll start off by talking about the biggest story of the off season, and that was uh, the best center of the NBA, Dwight Howard, decided to move from the Los Angeles Lakers after one season, and then he went on to sign a four-year, eighty-eight million dollar contract with the Houston Rockets. There were many people who were uh, surprised that Howard left the spotlight in LA to go to Houston. There were there were many people like me, myself, who uh, thinks Dwight just didn't want to play with Kobe, and maybe he feels like after the season they had last year, L.A. just wasn't going to have success for a while. I mean, I think that's what Dwight was thinking, and uh, obviously we've seen some things go on with him and Kobe. Now, he's with the Rockets with one of, if not the best shooting guards in the NBA, in my opinion, in James Harden, and I got to say the future looks bright with the young, talented Rockets team. Uh, hopefully Dwight could stay healthy. That, that'll be a big key. That'll be a big plus for the Houston Rockets if he could do that. But, uh, Brett, what were your thoughts when, uh, all this stuff went down with Dwight Howard last month? Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's just interesting last year how the Lakers season, uh, played out. I mean, how much drama went on with Steve Nash going down early. Obviously the coaching change with Mike Brown being, uh, removed and Brittany and Tony and the talk of Phil Jackson coming back. There was so much going on around the Lakers. I think the interesting point you make, Chris, is about Dwight Howard and, and you know, maybe not playing with Kobe or not getting along well last year or that not being uh, a situation where the two of them could coexist. But you talked about the future of the Lakers, and I think that's where a lot of people sort of look at the way Dwight Howard has, has handled the business side of things, not the basketball side of things, over the past couple of years and about being the guy who you could build the franchise around. And certainly the Lakers in obtaining Dwight Howard, not this summer, but last summer and having him for a year, were thinking long-term and for the future, you know, possibly another mantelpiece for when Kobe Bryant was going to be retiring or starting to wane a little bit in his skill set, and that Dwight Howard was going to be the next great Laker. And it's just never happened that a player of that stature, of that kind of value, of that kind of talent would ever opt not to stay in Los Angeles and wear the purple and gold. And I think that's where a lot of people are missed by the decision. However, I think on the basketball side of things, I think it's a perfect fit to go to Houston uh, to see what that team is capable of doing under Kevin McHale and the type, of, the type of championship caliber that they can put on the court probably before the Lakers can get back to that sort of uh, sort of competitiveness. And where do you see the Houston Rockets uh, ranking this season? I know it's still very early. I mean, uh, the, the NBA season still doesn't start for another couple of months. But uh, when when LeBron James and Chris Bosh reunited with uh, Dwayne Wade in Miami, they made it to the NBA Finals uh, their first year together, but they did not win it. Dallas definitely uh, took that championship from them. It seemed like they, they definitely deserved it. Uh, where, where where does Houston where does Houston go this season? I mean, it's kind of hard to say. Well, I, it's you got to look at the Western Conference, and, and obviously you know, their biggest fight is to try to make sure that they uh, obtain home court advantage in the playoffs. And when the playoffs get started, they'd love to be in one of those top four positions, and then you're competing against the likes of the Spurs, the Clippers, uh, Oklahoma City, and, and probably Memphis still in that mix. Um, with Golden State and Houston probably you're pushing either of those teams to try to get into the into the home court. But um, I think that the biggest thing is to see what Kevin McHale decides to do with Dwight Howard in terms of how they play their offense. Of course, if we remember the days under Coach Van Gundy in Orlando, they ran a lot of, of shooters, three-point shooters out on the arc and let Dwight Howard operate in the middle and, and kind of rely a lot on the three ball. It's something Houston likes or sorry, Orlando liked to do what Houston did last year. Um, so you would think that the fit would be allow, allow Dwight Howard to settle in pretty quickly. But I know that Kevin McHale probably 
knows that that's fraught with some danger as well. He's got to try to keep Dwight happy on the inside and use his athletic ability. And I think that's probably the most interesting relationship that's going to develop throughout the course of the year is the way that Kevin McHale works with Dwight Howard and gets him involved in what they're going to do offensively. But they are a very dangerous team, a very young team, a very athletic team, um, and, and hungry after what happened to them last year uh, to try to get a little bit further. So Daryl Morey's done a good job of, of piecing that thing together. And, of course, James Harden being the, the hugest piece of them all. I mean, what a year he had last year. Absolutely. Cannot agree with you any more on that one. And another team that has made some noise in the offseason is the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, they moved five players, including Marshawn Brooks and Gerald Wallace, and three first-round draft picks to the Boston Celtics for Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce, and Jason Terry. How good are the Brooklyn Nets? Well, they're, they're very good. They're very dangerous. Uh, obviously, a, a wealth of experience, but it, it's amazing that with all the years that Jason Kidd in the league as a point guard, no experience uh, in terms of having a head coach to push them. And so, he, obviously, the Nets are all in so much talk about uh, Mikhail Prokhorov and, and him opening up the vaults for, for the Brooklyn Nets and their roster this year in terms of the salary that they're going to pay out. But this team is extremely dangerous. Um, they're extremely deep. And uh, it's going to be really interesting in the preseason in the first couple games, like first 15 or 20 games of the season, to see how it is that Jason Kidd plays all these weapons that he has on the offensive end. Um, of course, defensively, I think they'll be much better with Kevin Barnett barking at guys. But on the offensive end, how is it that they're going to operate and who he goes to late in the game? There are mismatches that that, that lineup is going to create all over the place. Uh, to try and ask a point guard to guard Darren Williams or a two guard to stop Joe Johnson, a three man to guard Paul Pierce, a four man to guard Kevin Garnett, and then Lopez, who's one of the top centers in the league, and it's just a nightmare. So, um, looking forward to the first 20 games that Brooklyn plays and to see how Jason Kidd is operating, like I said, with, with all those tools he has on the floor and, and see if they can develop that camaraderie real quick. Were you surprised at all that the Brooklyn Nets hired Jason Kidd as head coach? Uh, I am surprised, but, um, you know, I grew up in the Bay Area. I grew up playing against Jason in high school. I've known Jason since we were kids. And, um, you know, the, the guy is just a winner. And I really like the fact that the Billy King just went outside the box a little bit. Uh, I really, you know, I get tired of the retreads around the NBA. And over the past five or six seasons, it's been really refreshing to see some franchises sort of think outside the box and to bring in some some assistants um, that have been on benches for a very long time and give them an opportunity to coach, a la Frank Vogel, uh, Dwayne Casey up in Toronto, who's been in the league a very long time. Mike Budenholzer getting the job in Atlanta. But to see a former player like Jason step right into the coaching ranks and having Lawrence Frank right next to him, uh, not shocked by it, um, very encouraged by it. I, I hope Jason has some great success. He is by far one of the most intelligent players that's ever put on the high tops, and, and I hope he does a great job. He's got, like I said, a great uh, canvas to work with for his first season. A lot of guys don't get this kind of opportunity to have this kind of veteran leadership and talent on their roster, and I hope Jason does a great job with it. It's going to be great to watch during the year. Yeah, I agree with you, man. And I don't know if it's just because Jason Kidd is my favorite NBA point guard of all time, but I'm really excited to see what he could do with the Brooklyn Nets. Obviously, they got a ton of talent with him. Uh, hopefully, he doesn't have to leave a, a regular season game to take a phone call, though. <laughs> I hope, I, and I would have liked at some point if they had a couple point guards go down, if he could sign himself to a 10-day contract. I think that would be awesome. That, that, that would just be great. And, uh, you know, a team that I feel people are overlooking that were uh, a part of that deal is the Boston Celtics. I, I still can see the Celtics getting a 7th or 8th seed in the playoffs with the pieces they currently have. Now, if they lose Rondo, maybe it's a different story. What do you think about that? Yeah, there's no there's no way they're doing anything like that if Rondo is not part of of what they do at the beginning. I think it's important, you know, if he was in training camp and working with all these young guys and having an opportunity to get started right away. And I'm not sure on Rondo's recovery. I really have not seen much news on on uh, where it is that he sits in terms of getting himself back and ready for the season. But their reliance on Jeff Green as their main source of scoring is just maybe not enough in terms of uh, what they have to deal with. Obviously, Gerald Wallace came over in that trade too, but 
that's not a lot of points on the board. So I don't know how it is that Brad Stevens is going to manufacture a lot of points with so many moving parts that Boston has. But obviously Danny Ainge is doing some things to set the Celtics up for their future, trying to make uh, the Boston Celtic future as bright as possible. Um, and this year is going to be a, a very difficult one in Boston if Rondo is not part of that equation at the beginning of the season. Chris Shanfield here talking with former NBA player, uh, Brent Barry on Sportsman Radio. Now, Brent, as a former NBA player, how would you feel if uh, the best player in the game today, LeBron James, becomes the president of the uh, NBA Players Association? Well, I think it would be a huge coup for the players to have LeBron involved uh, in that capacity. Um, I, I know I saw something, Magic Johnson made some comments about, you know, LeBron has a lot on his plate, but where does it fall in terms of a player's responsibility that to uh, assume the role of, of the leader of the players union and the players association uh, that, that that would be the most important job that he could have outside of obviously dominating uh, for the Miami Heat. I mean I think it would be uh, an incredible step for the players association that over the past 15 or 20 years has not represented itself well in terms of uh, setting up uh, the rules and, and um, setting themselves up for lockout situations and dealing with uh, the ownership group and David Stern in particular every time that the, the players have been forced to neg negotiate uh, the next collective bargaining agreement. They've never had that kind of chip. Those kind of guys are always called in at the last moment. So if LeBron were able to do that, it would be the biggest assist to the rest of the league uh, that he could give them. So it will be interesting to see that how that plays out. Yes, very interesting. And last topic, and I'll let you go, Brent, that is Derrick Rose and the Chicago Bulls. It was now two seasons ago. I, I can't believe, Chris, how did you not get to that first? That, I mean, being in Chicago, I would think that that's where you would go first. Hey, got to save the best for last, right? There you go. I agree with that. That is the most anticipated return of the season by far. You got that right, and it was two seasons ago. It was two seasons ago in the first game of the first round of the 2012 NBA playoffs. The Bulls were taking on the 76ers, and with a 12-point lead and about a minute and 20 seconds remaining, Rose drives into the hole and lands very awkwardly, and uh, eventually we found out it was a torn ACL. He sat out for the entire 2012-2013 NBA season, were you a fan of his decision to sit out for the whole season and come back when uh, he's 100% ready this season? I mean, Chicago was going crazy, man. Well, I, I recognize that after the All-Star break, you know, there was a lot of tension in and around Chicago and certainly around the Bulls organization and, and curiosity amongst every NBA fan around the league whether or not Derek was going to come back. And then it sort of stretched itself out into maybe in the playoffs and maybe this game and... Um, you know, I think at some point Derek had made the decision in his head that he was not going to return and was going to sit out an entire year and get himself ready to go, and he held steadfast to that. Um, I'm not upset with it. I think, you know, maybe you know, some of the news that came out with Derek's brother making some comments and things like that were, were not good for the Bulls organization, or Derek Rose in particular, especially in that city, given uh, how important he is to that franchise uh, moving forward. But... I, I'm really excited to see Derek come back, and, and no question, everybody's anticipating him being full strength and seeing what the Chicago Bulls team is capable of doing. They were so scrappy in the playoffs with Nate Robinson playing out of his gourd uh, and pushing the Miami team. But th these guys are, are a tough-minded group. Coach Thibodeau has them ready on every occasion, and to have Derek Rose back in the lineup, the addition of Mike Dunleavy Jr., uh, Taj Gibson uh, being in there, and, and Carlos having a great year last year for the Bulls. And it'll be just as dangerous as ever. But there's no doubt about it. Derrick Rose coming back to the NBA and being back on the floor and seeing him opening night is going to be one of the best things uh, this league could ever hope for. So looking forward to that. Yeah, man, I cannot wait. And it seems like every season the Bulls lose key pieces due to free agency. This year you mentioned Nate Robinson, uh, of course, losing Marco Bellinelli as well to the San Antonio Spurs. They did draft a couple of good guys in uh, Tony Snell and Eric Murphy. What are your expectations for Derrick Rose and the 2013-2014 uh, Chicago Bulls? Well, I do like those guys. I also like Marcus Teague as the backup and getting some minutes and having the chance now this year to uh, practice against Derrick Rose on a daily basis can only improve his confidence and get him uh, maybe in a little bit better situation so when he has opportunities throughout the year to step on the court uh, to be more confident with his play. And then the emergence of Jimmy Butler last year I think was just 
a huge coup for Coach Thibodeau because of how they can add depth now to their to their lineup, not only in terms of what they can do defensively with Dang uh, and Jimmy Butler if they happen to play together on the perimeter because there's a lot of guys they have to shut down on the Pacers and on the Heat that they're going to have to use that kind of land athleticism. But he was showing everybody last year that he was more uh, than capable on the offensive end to score. Uh, Mike Dunleavy is a, is a very complimentary player that's got a great skill set does a decent job of rebounding the ball, certainly a great three-point shooter that's going to stretch them out because they lost Marco, but those additions are fantastic. Uh, and the Bulls team is, like I said, always prepared, always play teams tough, always play within themselves, and having Derrick Rose back, um, it's going to take them a little while to, to find out exactly where he is and what he's capable of doing, but at some point, I would guess 40 games into the season, there's a lot of teams in the Eastern Conference that are going to start getting a little bit nervous about seeing the Chicago Bulls uh, either travel to play against them or having to go play in the United Center against the team that's healthy. Hey, man, I love it. And one matchup I'm certainly looking forward to seeing is uh, for the first time ever, and that is uh, Derrick Rose versus Kyrie Irving, two of the best point guards in the NBA that haven't been able to battle each other due to injuries. And uh, hopefully... At some point, we will see that matchup going on. But, Brent, i got to say, I really appreciate your time. It's been a pleasure having you on. Before I let you go, is there anything you'd like to plug on the air for myself and our listeners? I just hope your listeners stay true and, and uh, keep following what you're doing, Chris. I appreciate the time, obviously. I know it took us a little while to get it done, but better done than never done. Exactly. Like I said, man, I appreciate it. You're a man of your word, and hopefully we can stay in touch. Take care, man. No doubt. No doubt.